Itamar, um, one of the things I've asked you to talk a little bit about is Syria, because it hangs over the region in a very depressing way. Um, so you've written at least two books already on Syria and are now finishing a third. So oh, oh, um, over to you, please. Thank you. I was also the, the peace negotiator with, with Syria at a different time. Um, so for several years, actually, the Syrian crisis was the focal point of Middle Eastern politics, and not just the Middle East. Um, waves of refugees rattled Europe in uh, 2016 and affected elections in Europe and Brexit, and the uh, shockwaves reached all the way to the American elections of uh, the end of 2016. And uh, not just refugees, terrorists, thousands of uh, uh, ISIS uh, recruits who were European citizens trained in Syria and Iraq and fought there and came back uh, to Europe and some of them are actually in sleeping cells of terrorism and I hope that we will not hear again from them the way we did in Paris and Brussels but they are there so it's not a local crisis it was a major international crisis a terrible humanitarian tragedy half a million killed many, many wounded and maimed, almost six million refugees out of Syria, and almost half of the population displaced inside Syria. Now, one of the uh, explanations for the complexity of this crisis was the fact that it was not one crisis, but uh, three in one, domestic, regional, and international. The conflict between the regime and the opposition, a regional conflict, between the camps supporting the regime and those supporting the opposition and an international one. Now, the domestic uh, crisis, the civil war itself, was uh, resolved in December 19, uh, 2016 when the regime with the Russian and Iranian help captured Aleppo. That was the end of the civil war itself. The opposition does not practically exist, neither the political one nor the military one. They are still thousands of uh, opposition fighters who are in the area of Idlib, but they are not operating out of Idlib. Now, winning the civil war did not mean normalization of uh, Syria as a state. The regime controls maybe 60% of the national territory. Uh, there is the area of Idlib that I mentioned. There is an area actually conquered and managed by Turkey, and there is about at least 30% in the east and northeast that are dominated by the Kurds and the Syrian Democratic Front. It will be a while before uh, a unitary Syrian state exists and exercises sovereignty over the national territory. There is the question of reconstruction, a very costly project. Where will the money come from? And some of those who can offer the money, the United States, European countries, will not offer the money without uh, return of the refugees, but the regime is not particularly interested in the refugees and apparently the leadership is uh, quite happy with the situation that Syria now is a more homogeneous country, less Sunnis, more or proportionately more Alawites and, uh, and so forth. So the country is very far from normalization. Furthermore, the end of the domestic conflict meant an exacerbation of the regional and international conflict. Originally, Iran, uh, together with Russia, actually dominate Syria. Bashar al-Assad remained in power, but he is not fully an independent ruler. He is very much under the Iranian and, and Russian boots. Turkey is a major uh, actor interested. Uh, largely, the Kurdish question, the preoccupation, not to say obsession, of Erd Mr. Erdogan and Turkey is not to have an autonomous uh, area in Syria, certainly not to have a Kurdish contiguity uh, along the Turkish border and uh, connected possibly to Iraq. And this is the main motivating force in, uh, in Turkish policy now. Iran, uh, after making this massive investment in keeping Assad in power, wants to benefit. And it, it has whetted the appetite of the Iranians who want to use the presence in Syria in order to continue to build the regional hegemony. 
in an effort to build a second Lebanon uh, against Israel, uh, Hezbollah and more than 100,000 missiles and rockets in Lebanon, they are now trying to build a military infrastructure uh, in Syria. It's sort of an offensive defensive attitude towards Israel. And of course, if Iran is making that investment, Israel is determined to, to prevent it. Now, internationally, the two major actors are Russia and the United States. During most of the Syrian crisis, the United States was absent. The determination by President Obama not to be drawn played a secondary role, and Russia came to play the major role. Under President Trump, there is a, a change, and more recently, a, a new team that was given charge of implementing a policy, the essence of which is to deny uh, President Assad uh, money for reconstruction and to continue to exert pressure on him and, and through him on, on Iran and Russia. But Russia is now the dominant actor in uh, Syria. It has uh, not just a naval base, but also an air base, and with a very small investment, in fact, has made actually substantial gains in Syria. So Assad is left with these two patrons, the Russians and the, uh, uh, and the Iranians. He is actually more comfortable with the Russians because the Russians have limited ambitions. They don't want to manage, they want them to penetrate the society or to expand Shiite influence. They are just interested in the hegemony and the projection of power and influence to the rest of the Middle East. And it's likely that uh, Assad will try to play off the Russians against the uh, Iranians. So where does it, does it leave us? It leaves us with a situation whereby the Syrian crisis, as distinct from the Syrian civil war, is far from being over. The normalization <coughs> of the Syrian life and statehood and politics will take several more years, and the region and the world will have to continue to live with a Syrian problem that needs to be better managed in the future than it was managed in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um.